John 1, 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. John 17, 22 through 23. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. John 17, 24. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. John 17, 26. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. Isaiah 30, 20 through 21. Although the Lord gives you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, your teachers will be hidden no more. With your own eyes, you will see them. Whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. Colossians 2, 2 through 3. May the glory that may be encouraging in your heart and unite you in love so that they may know the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom all hidden treasures of wisdom and knowledge are. Hebrews 10, 25. Let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Colossians 1, 12 through 14. And give joyful thanks to the Father, who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of his son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Romans 8:18, 8, Paul speaking about the future glory. He says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. Merriam-Webster defines the word den. One, a room, often secluded, in a house or apartment designed to provide a quiet, comfortable, and informal atmosphere for conversation, reading, writing, etc. Two, a cave used as a place of shelter or concealment, a squalid or vile abode or place. I was in a den when I was first introduced to the beautiful power that comes from silence and meditation on God's word. Physically, I was in a den. I was sitting with fellow Gordon students and my two spiritual life group leaders around the awkwardly too large wooden table in the lion's den and lane, seemingly isolated from the rest of campus. Metaphorically, I was in a den. I was not yet one month out of a rehabilitation center for treatment of severe eating disorders. I was quote unquote recovered, but daily, hourly, continually to battle the eating disorders that seemed to manifest themselves as vile and squalid caves inside of myself. I was in a dark den. I was in a den when I learned through the blessing of my spiritual life group and the practice of Lexio Divina, numerous readings and meditations on scriptural passages, such as the one that I opened with, um, the power of being still and letting God act for me. 
It was a time where I learned to rest and become aware of what was going on in and around me, to let my soul come out to rest in God's presence. For me, Monday nights became a time when God would speak through his word and I was able to be encouraged, challenged, convicted, or I maybe didn't know what I was able to be. Um, but it was a time where in community with fellow students and believers, I could come before God and honestly acknowledge that I was grieving, not understanding that I'd question stirring, maybe anger, frustration, or often even joys to celebrate. I wouldn't know as I ran across the quad after my 300 hour class to get to my spiritual life group on time, what exactly it would be that God would tell me about himself through his word. But I learned through the discipline of going to my group every week and practicing the extremely hard discipline of silence, both in voice and thoughts, that if I opened myself up honestly, not trying to keep any secrets from God, that the Holy Spirit would work. That through the different readings and meditations on scripture, I could continue to discover what Jesus said about God, so I could believe in God the way he ought to be believed in, and that I myself would change and be refined as a result. The spiritual life group I joined sophomore year was a place where I learned to experience the new mysteries and intricacies of God. And from there, my experience with the spiritual formations was such a beautiful and personal way that I began to meet with the Lord that I wanted to share um, the different types of disciplines with other women on campus who were seeking a deeper knowledge of Christ. And so junior year, I led a spiritual life group where we practiced various spiritual formations like Lexio Divina, solitude, silence, breath prayers, etc. How incredibly blessed I was through meeting with and having the accountability and encouragement from those women. And all the more I became aware of God's many qualities and his unconditional loving presence. As I look back on my time spent in each spiritual life group, I praise God for the truths that he has revealed to me. My healer brings wholeness. That Christ, who alone satisfies, would be glorified and I would delight in him. Boldly, I rest in the confidence that my God will do great things. I am his precious child. His sacrifice forgives, and no longer does he remember my sin. He has freed me for freedom. For me, God used the spiritual life groups that I was involved in as a means to say, Caroline, you are broken, but remember I brought you up from the pit. Thanks to the disciplines I learned and the time I invested in spiritual life groups, I've reached a point of knowing God intimately enough that he reminds me, though I still struggle to this very day, feeling as if sometimes I'm suffocating under the attack of the eating disorders, that Caroline, you're far more than recovered. You're redeemed. Though my weakness is aggressively thrown in my face, my God is so great that he uses my pain, struggle, and shame to bring glory to his all-powerful and saving name. For that, I praise him. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Cody. So last semester, last spring, I was going through my emails, as we all do, kind of deleting one after the other somewhat absentmindedly, uh, because we get so many from Gordon. And if I may make up a phrase here, I, I had what I, what I call a holy pause. In, in the mess of just deleting email after email after email, I, I stumbled across this email from Lori Truschel about uh, applying to lead a spiritual life group. And again, I, I delete most stuff that I get from Lori, I'm sorry. But, um, but I, I had this moment, I had this moment where I said, wait, wait. And I stopped and I considered, maybe God has something for me here. There's this moment that I want to call a holy pause. And, and I, I thought about it. I just sat there and I, I thought, God, do you have something for me in this? And someone would call this just a, a moment of indecisiveness, almost like a squirrel in the middle of the road not knowing which way to go. Um, but I really think that something about this pause was prompted by the Holy Spirit, and I think that because of what followed. Because what followed was, was yes, my becoming a spiritual life group leader, and then from that stemmed this beautiful sharing of life and faith. 
and it deepened faith as I, as I walked out this, this faith and this life with, with my group. Last semester, I led a spiritual life group on A.W. Tozer's Knowledge of the Holy. Um, and our, our group, we came together quick, and we started really diving into the, to the book and learned some, some really cool insights and discussed some really great things. But I'm afraid that that sudden, so, uh, at some point has become the stereotype for spiritual life groups. That we get together and, and we discuss a book or, or we talk about a new idea, try and see something from a new perspective. And, and for me, that's, that was great. And if you were asked myself or, or anyone from my group last year, I do not doubt that we could articulate maybe one or two or, or hopefully more than that. Uh, things that, that we learned or ideas that we maybe conceptualized, some things that we understood about God a little bit better. But for me, that wasn't the value of that, of that spiritual life group. That wasn't really what it was all about at the end. And I think if you were to ask the group, what did you really get out of that? What did you really get out of the, your spiritual life group? They would say, and at least I know I would say, that it was the sharing of life and faith that was the most valuable experience. Not necessarily everything that we learned or talked about or discussed, but that activity of sharing life with each other and sharing our faith with each other. By about week two, we got into the practice of, of uh, showing up and we just started talking about how we saw God that week. And, and we would just go around in a circle and say like, Oh, well, you know, Amelia, how did you see God this week? And then she'd probably talk for 15 minutes. And so we barely got, you know, by the end of the hour, all we had done is talk about how we'd seen God that week and shared our life and shared our faith with each other. There were a number of weeks we literally did not discuss the book, and it's kind of like, well, why did I read this week? But the value of sharing life and the value of really experiencing life with each other and seeing how God was at work in each other's lives, it was so much greater than just the little tidbits of knowledge that we could learn. And I think, as, as, especially as Gordon students who are constantly flooded with information, I don't think we, we need necessarily another insight to remember, another statement to quote, another concept to understand. <laughs> I, I am, I, I'll keep doing that. <laughs> and here, here, here's my big idea. So that's not necessarily what we need, not to torture any of the professors or anything, we love you guys, but what we need, I think, are friendships that can be a shelter, a support, a challenge, and a home for our spiritual lives. Because I think that's what friendship really is. Now, if only there was something on campus that was offered that we could engage in those spiritual friendships in. I just... Lori, can you, jeez. <laughs> That's your hint. That's your hint. So my prayer is that this campus would really join together in the discovery that spiritual life is not something to be done alone, but in the context of friendships. And I hope that as you pass by the sign-up table in Lane today and tomorrow, that you also, like me, would have a pause. However holy it may be, have a pause and consider that if you sign up, God may have something seriously incredible in store for you. Thank you. Okay, Cody, I want to know, do you really delete all my emails? That's so insulting. <laughs> uh, oh, Laura, do you have your glasses? I actually need I just on the spur of the moment decided to read some scripture and I was asking for a Bible and, a, and Heather Davis gave me this tiny one. I said, there's no way I can read that one. Even this one, it's a little bit of a challenge. But um, I just wanna, I was thinking as, we, as I was hearing these guys talk about a scripture verse that is really convicting to me. It's Isaiah um, 30. And Isaiah is talking about the rebellious people, deceitful children, children unwilling to listen to the Lord's instruction. And in verse 10, it says, they say to the seers, see no more visions. And to the prophets, 
Give us no more visions of what is right. Tell us pleasant things. Prophesy illusions. Leave this way, get off this path, and stop confronting us with the Holy One of Israel. That actually has something to do with what I'm going to say. <laughs> In spite of what you heard um, from Caroline and Cody, in the past couple years, I've heard murmurings around Gordon that students feel uncomfortable talking about their faith to one another, and that spiritual conversations are often strained and uncomfortable. And I wonder why. Is it because we don't feel safe sharing what we know and what we don't know, or what we believe and what we don't believe? If so, that makes me really sad, and I'll tell you why. I attended another Christian college way back in the 80s, and I remember sitting rather compliantly in small groups, sharing with others how amazing it is that we were all Christians and how happy we were to be on the same page, and wondering anxiously how my roommate was feeling who was sitting beside me, knowing that she had lots of questions about God and God's word. I kept thinking that she might spill her guts, but she, she never did. And oh, was I glad about that because it would make everyone feel really uncomfortable if she did. Instead, I believe she suffered in silence. And to this day, she really doesn't know the peace that she was craving all those years ago. I loved my alma mater, but at the same time, the ethos of the place was all about being like-minded, but not in a healthy or biblical way, more in a don't rock the boat kind of way. If I hadn't had professors and campus ministers who challenged that attitude, I'm afraid I would still settle for nice talk and for pie in the sky living instead of real life in all its blessed messiness. And um, I read that scripture because in some ways that's what life was like. Just don't tell me the things that are controversial. Don't talk to me about the things that make me uncomfortable. I really don't want to know those things. I just want to be happy. And we used to sing a song. Um, I don't know if anyone, we, you did this when you sang it. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how, it's the same genre, I think, from Father I Adore Thee. But it was all about being happy and um, Anyway, that changed when I came to work at Gordon. When I was in my 40s, I learned how to be in community where transparency happens, where questions are asked and challenges made in civil and loving ways. I discovered that I didn't always have to agree with everyone in order to love them or to be loved by them. That was probably more important for me. In fact, because I saw it all happening around me everywhere here, I started to look forward to being with people who loved Jesus but didn't agree with each other. Because those conversations were rich and full and made me feel alive. And I didn't feel like I had to um, pretend anymore. I thought, this, this is fellowship. No pressure to pretend that I am on the same page as everyone else. No pressure to pretend that I know what I really don't know or that I feel what I really don't feel. But instead, what I got was encouragement to wonder about Jesus, to ponder God's word, and to grow in the love of Christ with others who are seeking to live faithful lives <clears throat> and others who may, might not even be sure that's what they want. And I want to encourage you to become a part of that kind of transforming community that is offered here at Gordon. Spiritual life groups are one way that that happens. There's lots of ways that you grow in your faith here. In the classroom, definitely. In your halls, for sure. In spiritual life groups as well. They're offered because we want to develop places and spaces 
where questions are welcomed, where opinions vary, where friendships are formed, where conversation about God and life in its fullness is rich and challenging and sometimes messy. And we need to welcome that mess in. Because as both of these guys said, we're broken people. And you know, when we try to pretend that we're not, we're, we're, we're denying the power of the gospel, which at its core is that we're weak and needy and we need the love of a savior. And that's what we have to offer in these groups. So what I'm going to ask right now is for all my leaders to come up and make sort of a circle, a half circle behind me. Mm -hmm.